and uh, welcome to the, the July 5th uh, Legislative uh, Committee meeting for the Town of Eglow. We'll start with the agenda. I'll be looking for a motion to adopt the agenda. Councilor Curtis makes the motion. Is there any additions or deletions? Seeing none, all those in favor? Garrett. Mm -hmm. Looking for a motion past the minutes of our last meeting. Councilor Warwan makes the motion. Any errors or omissions within those minutes? Councillor Barry. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, we often say that minutes don't contain enough. That I've, I, today I've got a situation where I believe it contains too much. Um, they're supposed to reflect the minutes, what is actually discussed during council. And I'm going to point out to 6.5 draft parks and open space bylaw, where it adds a couple of sentences. The section has since been reworked to indicate liquor will be permitted in the designated picnic areas. Schedule C has also been added to the parks and open spaces bylaw to identify the design picnic areas. At no time um, did we actually discuss that during our council meeting as council. We didn't discuss any Schedule C or need for it. So I think that that area shouldn't be reflected in the minutes because it wasn't part of our discussion. Um, council merely gave direction that section 9.3 be revised to be consistent with the Gaming, Liquor, and Cannabis Act. And then we further agreed that no other changes were required and that with section 9.3 amended, the bylaw could be brought to the regular council meeting of June 27th. So I just would like to have 6.5 reflect what actually took place during council. Thank you. Okay. So Councillor Berry is making a motion that we change the minutes to reflect what the conversation really was. Is there any comment? All those in favor of the changes in the minutes? Carried. So we're looking for, we have a motion now for the revised minutes. Would you be a, yes, so okay with that? Yeah. Okay, so all those in favor of the motions as revised? Carried. Thank you very much. Up first is uh, Director Rowe. Thank you, Worship. Uh, this is a letter uh, of June 22nd, 2022 uh, to Parks and Recreation and uh, Council will see seat on this letter. Uh, we, regret, we regret having to write this letter. We're extremely frustrated and happy with the planting and replanting of trees that we donated money for along Maple Street. What trees do well in unprepared soil riddled with weeds and couch? As seen digging out couch is a poor option as the roots are aggressively intertwined in a ball and flourish with watering. The variety of trees planted were not the ones promised, green Patmore ash and king crimson maple, as per letter of April 22nd, 2021. Does Greenland not honor their warranty on their trees that died? If not, why not? The letter of September 22nd, 2021 said much higher quality trees would be planted in the spring of 2022. Instead of replanting the nine to 10 dead trees, Time was wasted watering them, hoping that they would revive. Now they've been cut down, it is the summer, and all is at a standstill. On the north end of the street, some trees were planted, replaced with birch, which need a lot of water, and are subject to leaf miner, resulting in unsightly brown leaves, making them a poor choice. We thought our contribution would be appreciated and welcomed by the town, however, we feel it has been nullified by the way matters were handled. In retrospect, we could have asked the town to measure out an area of three to four trees in a select area, recommend trees suitable for Vegreville's climate zone and soil type, and we would have taken the responsibility to plant and care for them as they were well, until they were well established. And this is from Marge and Marvin Tomaszewski. Uh, so we have had discussion with a tree specialist that came out and we found the following. Uh, the Patmore ash would survive. Uh, the crimson king maples were not, a, were not a good choice. They do survive here, but because of the open area and the wind, 
uh, especially with the cold winter we had that following year was probably was not good for them. Uh, the soil can be prepared better and proper planting techniques were probably the reason that they did not survive. Plus we had a very bad drought year. Uh, we were uh, told that we sh the, the trees were alive, like the main stalks were alive. They were checked and just to continue uh, watering them, we added some fertilizer, hoping that they would establish and they did not. Uh, so we do have new trees uh, at, the grain at the greenhouse waiting to be shipped uh, when we can get planting. The problem is, is we're, we're short of staff right now and the excessive rain, uh, we're trying to get caught up on, on grass and, and weeds. So uh, the donation was very much appreciated and Parks is working to fix this problem. Any comments? Go ahead, Council Worley, you first. Just a question, so the new ones that are waiting, they're the green uh, Petmore ash then? No, a uh, tree specialist told us that we sh there were some different trees that we should be planting there, so. What kind of trees are, were they planting? Did they tell you for sure? We have the, we ordered 20, 20 trees for Sunrise Park, for Foxview, for Maple Street. There's a long list. I, I don't have it with me, so I can find out. But right. they were, we had basically shown the tree specialist where we're planting these trees, and they are the ones that told us what we should be planting there. So, okay. And it could have been also the bad winter uh, with all the salt uh, that was pushed off. So what Parks is going to do now is they're going to make sure that any snow that they remove from the trail is going to go uh, the opposite direction from, from the trees, especially if they're salting the, the walkways. Okay, go ahead, uh, Councillor Ruda. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the last comment that you made about preventing this from happening in the future. Is there a policy or a process that we have for consulting beforehand? Because I know when it first, when they were first planted, there were comments um, from some local um, arborists that were concerned about the the type of tree that they would not be appropriate for our zone and our climate. And this winter was particularly harsh. So, do we have something in place to make sure that we make good choices, prudent choices moving forward? and a plan in place. I mean, the Tomaszewskis have made a suggestion here at the bottom, and I guess that's where we've had our issue in the past with memorial trees too, is that sometimes the donations that our citizens make is with the assumption and the expectation that we would take care of it and deliver the same kind of care that they would for their own trees or garden area. So do we have a plan in place for the future? Thank you for asking that. Yes, we are working actually on a policy. Um, I've actually secured a local arborist uh, uh, the, at the end of the summer. They're going to be coming and doing a, uh, a basically a planting 101. Uh, and we do have a, we signed a contract with a greenhouse to uh, provide our, our trees uh, for the next couple of years. And they will, part, a part of that is they will come out they will test the soil. They will tell us exactly what trees, or give us some options of trees that we should be planting. So, but uh, in 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 this specific case, we we're quite certain it was the the way that the the trees were planted that they just it wasn't it, it wasn't proper. And I, you know, I'm not going to put the blame on anybody except myself. But it uh, they weren't they weren't planted properly, and that is the key reason that they didn't survive. Go ahead, Councillor Berry. Yeah, thank you, Worship. So I just have a question. I noticed that the letter is addressed to staff and uh, CC to Council. Um, have you had discussions with this, the residents, and are they satisfied with the direction that we're that you're moving? Okay, but that would be what the next steps. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so. Uh, we recognize that we didn't do a very good job, and uh, that's on us. How much uh, did um, uh, Margie and Marvin uh, put it towards this project? $2,500. And I've just been informed we're going to be planting Amer maples along Maple Street, which are a, a, a zone two and very subject to uh, this, this style of planting along roads. They'll, they're susceptible to salt, and they're 
<coughs> they're they're going to be very, uh, just like the uh, Crimson King, just not as big a tree. So. Okay, well, it's not the first time that we've seen people in memorials situation or a donation to town and we sort of dropped the ball and let them down. So I don't know what the answer is. I mean, we planting trees is something you need to take time and uh, do a good job of and take care of them. So if we're not going to be doing this, maybe we should just go to the tree to planting business altogether unless we can find some staff that uh, can handle tramp planting a tree. And there's care that goes in after care too. And there's no different than what's going on up by the the outdoor rink. There's seven pine trees there that are dead laying on the ground. What's the deal? Anyway, so you got a plan in place, and you're going to get back to, to the residents and tell them what the plan is moving forward. And uh, I don't know. If you want us to volunteer to go out and help? I mean, I plant trees all the time. I. I'll help. I mean, that's what it takes because if we can't rely on our staff to get some trees planted, we got some big problems. Okay, you get. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. And I, I guess just one thing in the future for doing a policy, and we've we either need to make sure that we're not indicating um, a specific, or if we have and we are for any reason not putting that in, we have to go back to them because if somebody's donated based on whether it's the right tree or the wrong tree, but if they've donated on a specific premise, then we have to make sure that we've gone back to them because I can see that. I mean, <laughs> it can't be something we do there. So either we are very careful to only mark one saying as recommended by a zone, or if we name them and there's any change, I, we always have to give that opportunity back to them. If I, if I could, when the original plan was put forth, uh, these were the ones that were that that we had had uh, selected, and uh, they 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 were just they were happy just having trees along there. That's really all they wanted. So you know these, I'm I'm satisfied that the new ones are gonna are gonna work. And uh, like I say, I don't want to blame our staff. It's it, our two senior staff were away on vacation when they were planted, and it was in the hands of summer students. And like I say that. It probably shouldn't have been done at that point, but. Well, moving forward, if somebody wants to make a donation or anything like that, I don't think we should be taking it anymore. Because if we're just going to be letting down the residents of the town thinking that uh, that we know how to plant trees, and obviously we don't, I don't think we should move forward. There's no sense letting the citizens down because people are on holidays. It doesn't make any sense to me. If we're going to do something, we're going to do it right. Councillor uh, Lemko. Yeah, and... Does your uh, call, uh, director Rowe, the uh, you're working on a plan for trees or just a policy on on trees and which trees aren't? Uh, my question is: Do we have a plan in place that we will we will budget X number of dollars to plant X number of trees every year in this community to replace the ones? that are, we're cutting down, because we're cutting down a lot of trees, but we're not putting any up. Uh, example would be at the, the egg park. There's a lot of spruce there that are are needing to be cut down, and the beavers do a good job of cutting down the trees that are growing. And we, we need to be planting, like along the walking trail, there's, there's nine trees that I counted that are done, 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 and holes where other ones were, uh, have died a couple years already. And so we just need to be putting some more trees in the ground and whether it's an arborist doing it or somebody that we can hold accountable for it, but we need to budget and move that kind of forward. That's just my question. So is there a plan in place, uh, like I said, because this is, this is no way to do things. No, I agree. And yes, we're putting together policies and they're all the staff are going to be getting trained, not just the two senior staff so that doesn't happen again we're going to be training everybody on uh, proper uh, planting planting protocols because uh, that ultimately is, is uh, I mean how we described it to the to the tree specialist that's what they said to, is what basically didn't didn't allow them to to to, uh, to grow and and to to get the roots established so so we will get a, we will get a proper process in place, the training, and then the planting, the the overall tree plan. Councillor Curtis. 
Thank you. Um, so just in my head, when I hear you say we're going to do planting 101, would this arborist or specialist come out and help you guys plant the next set of trees, give everybody a good tutorial, and then we're satisfied we go off on our own? Is that kind of the... Yes, that's part of the that's part of the fee for the for the training course is that we have to have some we have to have trees available to plant, and he will come and he will after doing theoretical and training, they'll go out and they'll actually plant it with the staff so that they understand uh, the difference between a potted plant and a big tree ball uh, tree tree uh, ball plant, so that they understand what the difference is. So, perfect. Thank so you. That'll be in the fall. Yeah, late, yeah, in the end of August. Summer students will be gone. It'll be our regular staff that they're training. Yes. Okay, so make sure that you reach out to Margie and Marvin. Let them know what the plan is. And if they are not happy with it, that we would uh, offer them a refund on their donation. And that, I think we all agree, we would definitely do that for them. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments on that? Okay, next. Okay, this is the highway signage. Uh, after the last, uh, we had a meeting in uh, June about the highway signage proposal. Uh, Council asked for some uh, some updated information, and uh, I've gone back to uh, Blanchett Neon and we've had some discussions so you've got uh, the different uh, pro the updated proposals here just showing showing the signs and the one with the re council requested a picture on the highway because i'll have this this just came in today so this everybody has it okay. so that's what the sign would look like <coughs> uh, so one thing, a couple of things I was asked to check on. So the 3D uh, Pesinkas, they're $17,000 each for, the, for those. And the, the top black bar goes actually right through the egg. Uh, what was the last quote you gave us on that? So they were, the, the original price was 120000 for the two signs. And there was a, a, a price for the egg? separate price well I, I I got prices to remove the LED lighting yeah. and the and to find out what the cost of the egg was because the 3d egg we had, had, had assumed that it was going to be quite expensive but it wasn't broken down into the original RFP so this is what they have given me is that each egg is seventeen thousand dollars so by removing the 3d uh, pesinka it would be ninety two thousand six hundred and thirty for both signs. Also to, if we decided to not illuminate the cabinet and don't put the LED lights, we're basically sa saving $845. That's not really the, the main cost. It, it's the, the cost of bringing power uh, from the from the, the oh, transmission okay, line. Well, let's just stop. Okay. We all agreed last time we weren't going to bring power to them. We were going to use a paint that was illuminated. Yep. Okay, so let's just stick to the plan. Okay. So, uh, so the vi visit Vegreville. So, so to have the visit Vegreville in reflective uh, right. uh, uh, vinyl. That's five hundred and seventy-five per sign. So I think that is the way to go. That would be well illuminated on the blue background. Now we're just, w I'm just waiting for a price on what it would be to just have a basically a two dimensional Pesinka, uh basically printed on vinyl and put onto uh, aluminum and put in place of where the current 3D egg uh, Pesinka is. Is that something that council would like to see still? Councilor Barry, sorry. Thank you. I can't recall us talking about removing the 3D Pesenka. I thought that was one of the reasons that we rather liked this design, was the 3D Pesenka on an angle that reflected much the, the original uh, well, I was egg asked, at the park. I was asked to ask if they can bring down the cost to within our budget, and this is this is the way to bring it down. 
my mind because we were looking at what are we going to get for the dollars even though we had to maybe spend a little more if we were liking the design because we did start out as we've discussed more than once <laughs> the aspect of having two hundred thousand dollars in budget that we didn't reduce down to a hundred thousand for in the budget but I don't recall us unless others can recall I can't recall that we were looking for a whole new design I rather like what we were talking there I thought that we were just trying to get a visual of it um, as it would look along the roadside uh, and I thought that we had removed the Easter egg comment but uh, continue <laughs> So I guess what it comes down to, we all agreed on the, the layout of the sign. We agreed that we'd get the price on the reflective paint. And the original one we seen it was a, a piece of aluminum that had a, a film on it or a, for the egg. It wasn't a 3D egg the very first time we seen this. No, the first time it had the 3D egg on it. Okay. And that's when, and when my, my notes that I had was to see if we could reduce the cost somehow. And so I just asked him to break down what the cost of, because everything else is pretty, it, it, it's fixed, but that 3D egg, I assumed is probably going to be a, a high cost. And so that those are $17,000 each. That was their design concept. Uh, in speaking with a senior designer, he doesn't feel that the 3D egg is that necessary, especially doing 120 kilometers an hour. He said if this was in a 50 or 60 kilometer zone, like coming into, into town by where our current signs are, he said maybe because then people are gonna actually see it. So again, this is just for discussion to. Go ahead, uh, Councilor Worla. Okay, so at the 92,630, um, that would be theoretically the exact same design without an egg on it, right? No. It's going to be a two-dimensional egg. Okay, so that yeah. doesn't. It'll the still be there. It just won't be the three D egg. Okay, that's the yeah. clarification. Aid. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Councilor Reedy, if there's something that you'd like to bring up. Perhaps I'm not great at looking at the design previously. I didn't realize it was three D. So me neither. Uh, I thought it was just a flat aluminum. Yeah. It's so it's a three D. So to egg. my to my mind, I think I mean it's a creative idea, but I don't know that it would be appreciated in this instance. And I think for what we're looking for is a modern updated um, version of the signage and I, I don't think that having a 3D version is necessary. So just further to what uh, Councillor Warwick said, I just want to clarify that. So on page seven and eight, what you've shown us there is a non-illuminated, we'll say uh, 2D, I think yeah, is $92,630. Yes. Okay. I, from my point of view, I don't know that we need the 3D in that, on the, in that instance. I, I think that might be design, not utilized to full capacity, and it's a lot of money. So thirty-four thousand dollars more to have them both in 3D. I'm saying no. Uh, Councillor Barry. Okay. So what you're saying is that we would have the sign with the arch and the egg, but it would be mounted onto the arch and not 3D. Yes. But it's not one of these other signs that suddenly have been added in here down below where the total design has changed. 506, page 506. No, so. Th so we are still talking about the design that we like the best. It's just that it's a 2D egg on an angle which I'll agree with you at higher speeds would still look 3D as you would whip and buy it. Yeah, and with, with and that, I don't have a problem. Yeah, and my apologies to the, the last two pages, the secondary design, that was, uh, that was their suggestion for signs on 857, uh, oh. north and south, welcoming people into the community. So that I shouldn't have had that. In. Oh, okay, okay. So yeah, that's, that has nothing to do with Okay, that's a lot more clarity. Now I will agree that we don't need the 3D because in essence, we're still talking about the same sign. Same sign. <laughs> Thank you. So one thing I do uh, 
a bunch at Neon because the council did ask me to remove the Ukrainian Easter egg uh, portion and in their professional opinion they're highly recommending that we keep that those words in there there's no extra cost for this but they uh, 96 percent of the motoring public are not going to know what Pesinka is because we know what it is because it's it's our culture but to the majority of the motoring public Pesinka is not it's not an English word that they would know of it's not like the world's largest banana that people would know uh, when they actually drove through here when they were doing an assessment they the the staff that started this they had to look up what Pesinka was and Google it they 52% of the traffic going by is from Saskatchewan. You think they don't know what it is? <laughs> and, and, and one thing that he did mention to me is that when they were doing this, and they just did it as a test, that when they passed a sign, the big green sign that says world's largest Pesinka, they Googled, they had a passenger that Googled Pesinka. By the time they got the information, they had just passed the exit. So uh, again, by having Ukrainian Easter egg, it it is just one one thing that could do to, you know that could have people veer off qu uh, quicker and not having to Google it. So I, again, this is council's choice. I just when I told them that we wanted it removed, they said they can do that, but they would just from their marketing and their experience that they would suggest leaving it because it doesn't it doesn't cost us anything extra. Yeah, I'd like to keep it um, in there. I'll, I think it's, I'll get over there. I think it's uh, it speaks to our community and uh, the things we do. Uh, I mean, our murals are Ukrainian featured, and the sign is uh, blue and yellow, as, as uh, other things in our town. So, adding it there just brings that flavor of uh, who we are as a community at this point in time. Councilor Curtis. Sorry, I was slipping through the uh, Go East. I just was going to ask my colleagues that are on tourism, is that how we refer to it? I, again, I think we need to be consistent. Whatever we do with tourism is something that we need to do with our town documentation. So I'm not sure. <laughs> I feel like well, my council mates who are on tourism. Yeah, and that's certainly because we all know what that is. Again, to the traveling public, uh, I, I, I agree with Director Rowe that uh, the majority of people might not know that, and that's what we want to track into our town. The other ones that are making a mission here know uh, Pisanka, but it's that person driving by that says, well, it's a large Easter egg, uh, Easter egg, a Ukrainian egg. I think I'm going to stop in. You don't like yes or no questions. I just feel like, uh, well, whatever. I'm fine with whatever the majority decides. I just think be consistent. And I, I don't see it in the this well, tourism. Can you take it into account a little bit, though? Of other people? Sure. Of people that don't really know yeah. what Pisanka means. Absolutely. I understand that, and I appreciate the example that they gave. So I'm fine with it. Councilor Worla. I'm fine with it, although I'm going to tell you I judge anybody who couldn't figure out what a Pasenka is, but I'm totally okay with it. And I do like the 2D. I actually think now that we see the 3D in this way, it actually looks a little bit goofy from the side, so I'm good with the 2D. Councillor Bullock. I'm good with it staying in. 2D Pasenka, good with me. And the Ukrainian Easter egg. And Sorry. Ukrainian That's Easter That's what we're talking egg. about today, right at this moment, is the Easter egg comment. Councillor Barry. Well, I was told by a marketer at one point in time the reason to have the Easter egg on there is it catches the eye of the kids and they immediately say, Daddy, can I see the e Easter egg? So I'll say, leave it in. There you go. So $92,630, we get two signs installed. And we're okay with the dimensions. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, uh, what's that, sorry? $570. 
that's in, that's included in the ninety two thousand. So, yeah. So, oh, go ahead, Councilor Rudy. I do have one more question about the yellow background, blue paint writing at the bottom, underneath the visit Vigerville. It is a little hard to read on here. Do you have an example in person that it looks? It's hard to differentiate. So I'm wondering if it's hard here, what it'll be like on the highway in bigger letters. So the white on the blue is easy to see. I'm just wondering what this yellow and blue is gonna look like. I, I'm not certain that it looks um, very visible. Maybe black, potentially. Maybe, uh, and white might. That, I appreciate that. The only thing I would say is that there are examples, for example, the, the reasons that they choose the colors of the signs on the side of the highway is based on visibility and the need to be able to read it. So I would just perhaps ask them, I, I mean, I don't know if that's unifying across, I don't know that I would say black necessarily, Councillor Warwa, but something, it, it is kind of hard to see. And if they had another example where it is visible, that might be reassuring to be able to know that if we have a 10 foot printed boo-boo that we've uh, done our homework before we do that. Okay, I can look into that. So our, um, does this have to go to a regular council meeting for approval or can I start the process of drafting up the uh, agreement with them? The reserve transfer has been approved and budgeted, so as long as we're on budget you can go ahead and that's okay with council I can start the process and because we have a 12-week timeline to uh, to get this installed and the longer we wait you can go ahead and uh, ha ask them for a rendering with uh, the writing on the bottom in a different color okay we'll take a look at that okay. that's all we'll need but right now it's a go and we just want to just uh, dive a little deeper into the visibility of the smaller right Okay, sounds good, thanks. Okay, thank you. Everybody's good? Thank you. Director Rowe, next up, Director Lefebvre. <coughs> Excuse me, thank you, Your Worship. I have correspondence here from Stephanie Woja and Lisa Jagalik. Um, it is addressed to Councillors Justin, Tina, and Tanine, Town of Vigerville CEO, Public Works Manager, Planning Development Director. Uh, it says, I reside in the cul-de-sac on the northeast side of Vigerville at 56A Avenue. Among the recent development of this area, there are no sidewalks in our cul-de-sac or on the west side running north and south of 45A Street. There are a number of school-aged children, including my own, who attend St. Martin's School and walk to and from school each day. They utilize the sidewalk on the east side of 45A Street. However, they must cross the street to get home, forcing them to jaywalk where there is no designated crosswalk. Lisa Jugalik's children cross at the same place to access the grass alleyway, which their residence, their residence on 57 Avenue backs onto. Given the two narrow turns of 45A Street, there are multiple blind spots as vehicles approach, and when vehicles are parked along the street, it makes it especially dangerous for them to cross anywhere along 45A Street. Speed is also a factor here. Myself, Lisa Jugalik, along with numerous other parents in this area, would love for a crosswalk to be painted here with one sign at both the north and south curve at 45A Street warning motorists of the upcoming crosswalk so our kids have a safe place to cross. Attached, we propose to the crosswalk to be painted. It is in the middle of the straightaway of 45A Street, giving motorists the clearest view and the most time to respond to a pedestrian. It also aligns with a small patch of sidewalk on the corner of the resident at 4501. I'm unsure if that belongs to the resident there or if that is a property of the town of Vegarville, but we would be happy to approach a property owner for permission for the town to do so if need be. In the attached photo, the green line is where the proposed the crosswalk to be and the red outline areas are where we suggest the signs should be, although I presume there is protocol as to where the signs are placed in relation to crosswalks that will be utilized. There is a second attachment to show the area of the sidewalk on the west side of the street where the proposed sidewalk would meet. Feel free to contact either myself or Lisa Chigalik for further clarification if needed. We look forward to your decision and appreciate your consideration. Stephanie Woja and Lisa Chigalik. Okay, uh, so uh, Director Lefebvre, uh, how long would it take to, to make this happen? Uh, this would not take much time to make it happen. 
he uh, I just want to inform council that we have a lot of crosswalks that we paint in residential areas in town and there's only a few that meet just an in-house criteria that says now we're putting up uh, the signs that say pedestrian so if we go to places like um, Heritage House on Maple Street there's a crosswalk that crosses a stretch of road that is not on an intersection those have the signs uh, CPC we put a crosswalk for them to cross over there's signs there because there's no intersection there's one on 47th Street at the railroad tracks just at the, when the walking trail comes out there's one on 47th Street by the outdoor uh, soccer um, outdoor skating rink at uh, the ODR thank you uh, there's one there and there's one um, where there's a straightaway and no intersection that's where we put them so if council's in favor of putting a crosswalk here this is one that would require signage uh, location will be determined on distance from the crosswalk which I believe is, t is 10 meters but I can confirm that well I think we could all agree that anywhere that there's a, a well-traveled path to and from school uh, whatever is needed there but I mean looks like a, a cross point there and put the signage up I don't think anybody would be against that right now I did tour that cul-de-sac sorry Councillor Riddick and uh, but there is two signs at the beginning of the cul-de-sac when you come in that say children playing the yellow signs they're very old but they're there so obviously those were put up at some point because of the same kind of complaint so I think this would add to it and complement those two existing signs okay go ahead Councillor Riddick yeah I think this is um, a reasonable request for sure my question was about the signage for the school zone. Where would that be located in relation to the pedestrian crossing sign? Just there is a in at this location. Yeah, because there wouldn't be right. There are There's no, no school zone right. right there. No. So I think for that reason, then the pedestrian. This may not be typical, but I think it, it's a reasonable request to have that attached to the crosswalks. Sounds like a good idea to all of us. I support it for fully. Get her done. Consider Thank it. you. Director Saskew. Thank you, Your Worship. We have some variance analysis. So, uh, we'll open it up. So, on the first page here, it's the statement of net financial assets. So, as of June 30th, 2022, the net debt provision position of the town has improved. This is due to an improved cash flow due to collection of property taxes so we're in we're in a good cash position at the end of June imagine that and then increases in deferred revenue so that's what happens we receive grants like MSI ahead of time in the year and then we don't spend them until the end of the year so our deferred revenue is higher so our net debt position is actually positive at the end of June but it will more likely be more similar to what it is at the 31st of December by the end of the year one other thing to note on this page is the property tax balance outstanding is 4.2 million as of June 30th. That is due to the timing of this report. We actually have less taxes outstanding than that. It's just when I compiled the report, that's what was still outstanding. So. Is there any chance, Director Saskia, that the province has paid theirs on time? They have not. Oh, sorry. So we have, as of right now, we have $3.36 million outstanding for property taxes, and we, we know that the grants in place of taxes are in excess of a million dollars. So it's a good chunk of it is them. So moving on. I wonder where that puts us in uh, on, their, uh, on their wall of shame or where that the scale well, system... I did that calculation. So as of June 30th, we have 72.1% of taxes collected. So I think we're over 30. So I think we're not on the wall of shame right now. Okay. So we're doing okay. <laughs> but we would have, if theirs was paid. We would have less than probably 10% outstanding. Right. <laughs> 20%. Okay, well, if you work for the provincial government, just hope you're watching. <laughs> <laughs> Should have brought it up at the premier yesterday. It was a good opener. <laughs> yeah. Okay, carry on. Okay, so as at June 30th, 2022, the town has completed 50% of its fiscal year. This report will discuss variance from the same period in the prior period and when current revenues and expenditures are greater than 50% of the budget. So uh, for general government services, the summary here shows that 
Revenues are $320,000 lower for the period ending June 30th. Comparable period of 2021 had resulting in about 93% of the total budget year to date. So we've collected 93% of the budgeted revenue for general revenues. Corporate services were doing very well. We have 3,400% of our budget. This is due to actually $270,000 increase over last year, and this is due to our $287,000 at co deposit. I have in here that it was land sales, but the, it's actually the at co deposit that's in corporate services. The land sales are in development, so, and a small WCB refund. So that is always nice to see. Expenditures are approximately $2.1 million less than the current year as compared to 2021. This is due to payment of requisitions in the amount of $2.1 million that are still yet to be paid in 2022. So we've only paid um, one quarter of requisitions and the remainder is still outstanding. Uh, council expenditures have declined 74 thousand from year to date from the same period in 2021. This is with respect to purchase services and purchase goods due to reconvening in-person meetings. Actually, I have that backwards. It should be they have increased 74,000. I apologize. And then corporate service expenditures have also increased 46,000 in 2021. And currently that's about 44% of total budget. So we are on par for all of those expenditures so far. Uh, moving on to strategic services. So you can see the revenues are not collected as high compared to budget, but that is because some of these um, are budgeted transfers from operating reserve in 2021. Those reserve transfers have not occurred in 2022 to date. So that's just me doing a journal entry that I haven't done yet. So the money is there. I just have not transferred it. Uh, revenue for economic development in 2021 included budgeted transfers from reserve and the recognition of the final amount of the CARES grant, which was about $21,000. So there have been no reserve transfers to date in economic development either. Uh, moving on to strategic services, expenditures year to date are approximately 73,000 greater than compared to the same period in 2021, but they're overall lower than expected budget. So lots of this is related to um, just the beginning of the year 2021 was still COVID closures and restrictions and we weren't convening any kind of in-person meetings and whatnot like that. So a lot of that story holds true for this entire report. Um, the increased costs for communications over prior year are due to timing of the hiring of the new communications manager in 2021 and also reduced advertising and promotion offset by increased costs of purchase services, which are in line with budget for 2022. So everything here is below in expenditures is below 50% of budget. So we're very much on par for spending. And the increases are, like I said, due to reconvening of in-person, having a full complement of staff load in strategic services for 2022. Are there any questions on that? Everybody looks like they're keeping up. <laughs> Thrilling stuff, I know. <laughs> so community services, we'll move on to this one. So this one has uh, protective services, FCSS, tourism and culture, parks and recreation facilities, and community services admin. So if you look at all the revenues, all of our revenues are between 13 and 40 percent of revenue of budget so we're slightly below the 50 percent but a lot of the revenues are related to timing of receipts of grants and fines revenue there's some grants that probably haven't been recorded yet they're sitting in deferred revenue so there's nothing alarming looking at any of these revenues so far to date and then as far as expenditures they are all well below the 50 percent so the like some are even in the 30 percent so some of the expenditures I'll touch base on are expenditures for FCSS are approximately $71,000 greater than the same period in 2021. This is about 34.5% 30 of the total budget, but the increase compared to prior year is a result of increased expenditures for the Parent Link Center and the Family Resource Network, but these are also offset by increased grant revenues. So there are some areas where there has been a significant increase in expenditures to date but they're still on par with budget and it's related to the grant revenue so same thing with tourism and culture has increased 163,000 compared to 2021 <coughs> it's resulting from increased salaries and wages of the vic and that's one same thing like lifting covid restrictions and 
other items like that. Uh, expenditures for parks and recreation have increased 500,000 compared to the six months of 2021. It represents 40% of the total budget. This increase is attributed to increases in wages, goods and services of 208,000 um, aquatic, uh, or sorry, 208,000 in aquatic and 174,000 in the arena. So this is also due to the COVID shutdowns in comparable period of 2021. I do believe for a period of the time, the arena and the pool weren't even in operations of 2021. So there was also an increase of $78,000 in playgrounds and that was due to the new playground additions in the spring of 2022. Um, expenditures for facilities increased 136,000 compared to 2021. This is due to increases in the social center and multiplex expenditures. Same thing, COVID shutdowns and general um, expense increases across all facilities. So we're just seeing um, inflation in across the board. But same thing, we are still below 50% of the budget. So we're dealing with inflation, but we're also making sure that we're on track with budget. So. So far, I'm not seeing anything to be worried about in any of those. Moving on to IP and D. Uh, revenues as a percentage of budget are close to 50 and actually subdivision we're at 196%. And that is because that is our Foxview land sale. So there's three lots that were sold at the start of this year. So if you also look into the expenditure side, subdivision and development is at 136% of their budget. That is because land sales and the cost of the land sale are not budgeted because they're not guaranteed. We're not gonna say we're gonna sell three lots this year because then we're levying taxpayers or not levying taxpayers for something that may or may not come true. So that is why you're seeing those alarming amounts there. But in the end, the revenue outshines the expenditures and then any excess is put to the land sale reserve. So um, touching base on some of these, the Revenues for municipal services has decreased 64,000 compared to 2021, sits at 39.2% of budget. Revenues in 2021 saw $40,000 more in landfill, landfill fees as June 30th and included budgeted transfers from operating reserve of 22. So there's been no land sale or re reserve transfers in 2022 to date. So that's part of some of the discrepancy there. Um, subdivision and development revenues increased 83,000 compared to 2021 and sits at almost 200% of budget. That's due to the increase in permits and licenses and the sale of the three Foxview lots. Uh, public works expenditures are $162,000 higher than in the same period of 2021, only currently at 20.5% of budget year to date. So we have an increase in fuel and oil amounting to $45,000 compared to the prior year and goods purchased amounts to $20,000 excess over the same period in the prior year. So we're definitely seeing the increased fuel prices and the increased goods prices in public works especially. Um, services purchased in roads is $40,000 greater than 2021 and that's due to some crack sealing that was done in early June. So in prior years, we probably got billed for that a little bit later. Municipal services expenditures increased 177,000. Um, 18,750 is due to capital purchased out of revenue for the deposit on the landfill tent structure. There's also 14,500 spent on garbage bins and the remainder is due to increases, even increases over the remainder of the expenses. Um, overall, municipal services is still below unexpected budget and 37% of that spent to date. Um, purchased water has increased $114,000 over the prior year. So that's, we see those increased prices year to date and then also just like the consumption of water, right? So that is same. We're still at 35.6% of budget, so well below the 50%. So overall, we're seeing a lot of increased costs, but we're still on par with budget. So it'll be interesting to see how that trend continues to throughout the remainder of the year. Um, the next little um, chart here is the summary of revenues by source. So that's just all these same revenues broken down into different um, into their different groups. So one thing I'm going to touch base on here is the net municipal taxes are $188,000 greater than in 2021. I will remind everyone that council did not increase the tax levy this year. What had happened in the prior year is we levied taxes based on the assessment that we had and then our assessors changed the assessments down and so then we ended up collecting less taxes on those properties that were changed because 
The tax rate is set based on the assessment that we have at the period in time when we're setting the bylaw, and then if they change it down, the mill rates are now not calculating correctly. So it says that we're received more for net municipal taxes, but it's just because we're not operating in a deficit as we were last year because of those changes. So just wanted to touch base on that. Um, user fees have increased 194,000 compared to the same period of 2021 and slightly expected ahead of expected budget to date. That's due to that um, user fee that we introduced to cover that one debenture, I believe. So that's nice to see. Um, government transfer for operations decreased 173,000 compared to the same period of 2021. And franchise fees and investment income has increased 205 compared to 2021. Franchise fees are higher than 2021 and investment income has also increased due to higher rates than expected for 2022. So there's been increase in prime rates, our investments are doing better and that is always nice to see. Um, the next chart here is expenditures by type and really nothing on here that really needs to be touched based on too, too much. The other transactions, allowances and adjustments, I will mention that one. It's largely made up of the cost of the Foxview lots in 2022. So the budget was 89.5 and then in there we have a higher cost because we have the cost of land sales for the Foxview lots. So that's us. When we purchase land or work land that's available for sale, it sits in an asset account. So it's, we don't expense it right when we pay for those fees. So say we spent $200,000 servicing Foxview Law. That's completely a ludicrous number. We, instead of expensing it in the year that it's incurred, we put it as an asset as land held for sale. And so as we sell off those lots, the portion of that $200,000 we spent gets brought into expense recognized at the same time as revenue. So just to be clear, we haven't spent money on Foxview lots this year, but we're recognizing the expense from prior years that we have serviced those lots and made them available for use. And on the very back page, we have a summary of the capital budget. So you can see a lot of items are at 0% actually spent, but they are in progress. So. Um, for example, the AC unit for our server room that has been ordered and we won't be invoiced for that until the installation is complete. So there's a lot of things that have been ordered that we're waiting for them to install or put into use. And until then we haven't spent any money on that. So if there's any specific questions. Anybody? Uh, Councilor Rudy. Um, I didn't have it before, but now that you've explained it, when you're talking about caring for the value of the the servicing of the lots at Foxview Heights, for example, and now you're reconciling it, is it at the cost that was incurred at the time or is it at current cost? It's at the cost that's incurred. So our cost for, this is for accounting purposes, is the cost that we put into it. So we, I don't have to value forward what that would have cost us in today's dollars. It's whatever actual dollars were spent. So if we service those lots in 1985 and we didn't have to do anything to them and they were selling them now, that would be our cost on it. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, the transfers to local boards and agencies were 2.9% over. Mm -hmm. Those transfers and grants or whatever were, were in the budget. It was like, why the heck could we go over? Like, I know we give them out. Within fifteen hundred dollars, there could be something that was put in there that needs to be looked into. I can, I can definitely look into. Oh, it. I don't have that on. I don't have that one memorized, unfortunately. Okay. No, you can't memorize everything. But yeah, I should have looked into that. But all in all, we're halfway through this budgeted year and we're right on track with our, our spending. We're a little less, we're under 50%, so. Yes. That's right. It's the goods purchased and the fuel and oil that it'll be interesting to see how those continue to trend. Like maybe we'll be lucky and it'll be a a light snow year, but if it's another heavy snow year, it'll be interesting to see if we can stay on track with our current budget. Okay, any other questions of Director Sosky? Okay, well, thank you for the update, and uh, hopefully uh, we'll get the rest of those taxes collected, and uh, mm -hmm. we'll be good. I'll email the government. Okay, so up next, do we have the 2022 fees and changes amendment uh, bylaw? So that one is me as well. 
So this is a memorable to council. The topic is the amendment to the 2022 fees and charges bylaw proposed by Chris Leggett. So background, the annual fees and charges bylaw is passed at the December council meeting to allow for the fees and charges to come into effect on January 1 of the budgeted year. Circumstances can arise that require a second look at the fees and charges throughout the budget year that may constitute a change in the amount of revenue the town collects. The following schedules have been reviewed and the required changes are as follow. So Schedule E, Building Permit Fees. The Town of Eggerfield has held a contract with Inspections Group for their safety code services for building, plumbing, gas, and electrical disciplines since 2004. The town, along with the service from TIG, have maintained a good standing accreditation with the Safety Codes Council due to the working relationship between us as well as the care and attention from TIG. The town administers the building permit applications and the inspections group completes plan reviews and inspections to ensure that builds, at minimum, meet the Alberta Building Code requirements. The building permit fees are split 75% inspections group and 25% town. Planning and development are proposing an increase of 5% for all permit fees as well as an addition of a fee for a variance request and an addition of a fee for a permit extension request. The last fee increase for this was in 2015. The next one here is Schedule J, Dog Fees and Charges. In April of 2022, the Responsible Pet Ownership Bylaw was approved and adopted by Town Council. This bylaw requires an update, Schedule J, Dog Fees and Charges. We propose that Schedule J be renamed Animal Fees and Charges to include new, uh, the new fee for cats. A reminder that a cat license is optional unless a cat has been seized or caught at large. Schedule K, Fire Fees and Charges. The following charges are being increased to be in line with provincial rates. The Town of Eggerville has not adjusted these fees since 2018. So motor vehicle incidents, fires, command unit per hour is 190, and then per unit per hour is 650. Hazardous materials response, command unit per hour will be 190, and then the per unit per hour will be 650. So financial implications. Schedule E, at the end of May, the total building permit fee amount was 20182 which of this 5045 would have been to the town, the 25%. The additional 5% would have totaled an additional $1,000 um, overall and $252 to the town. There is an average of one variance and one permit extension request every two years, so those won't be too well used. Schedule J, the town has averaged 85 dog tags issued for the last three years, and to date, 59 licenses have been issued. The new responsible pet ownership now includes a voluntary cat license, a lifetime license for both dogs and cats, as well as other regulations that did not exist in the prior dog bylaw. This amended schedule now includes all the fees and charges that are required in the responsible pet ownership bylaw. And Schedule K, the increase of $5 per hour is minimal and will help offset the expense for fuel on the vehicles. So the communication strategy, both planning and development, both the planning and development part department and community services will work with the communications department to have a notice of the amended fees and charges posted to the website and social media. In addition, planning and development will email this notice directly to some of the bigger contractors in town that get multiple building permits a year so that they're made aware of any changes. And so the options that we're recommending to council are one, request the draft 22 fees and charges amending bylaw to go to the next council meeting for three readings as written, or refer the draft back to administration for changes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. So all in all, the changes are, I don't imagine $5 represents per hour fuel cost uh, on the highway. Um, the building permits and the uh, other application fees are need to be adjusted. It's not anywhere thousand dollars is really not a lot of money we're talking about here so is there anybody that wants to refer this back to administration for some changes go ahead Councillor Barry starts um, schedule J yes I don't recall us approving a lifetime license for both dogs and cats okay, well, we're just gonna yeah. just stop there for a second we're gonna go to uh, Legislative assistant. Uh, okay, thank you. Sorry. Yes, sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, yes, I was going to say I don't recall in the final draft of the responsible pet ownership 
by law that the lifetime license for dogs and cats was approved. Um, does anybody else recall? It definitely wasn't. Go ahead, uh, Councillor Bodie. Yeah, and bylaw number 07-2022, Responsible Pet Ownership Bylaw, Section 42, Licensing Dogs, uh, Subsection Q, Dog Licenses Must Be Renewed Annually by February 28th. That's what it says. So there wasn't anything about lifetime in there. It definitely, that was brought up in the past and we shot that down, for sure. So when we get to Schedule J, before this gets to our meeting, if we can use the right reference to the Responsible Pet Ownership Bylaw. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I, with that change in wording, I wouldn't have a problem with the overall bylaw coming forward just the removal of that um, lifetime license for cats and dogs. If that is removed, then I'm fine with everything else. Okay. So the change is made to uh, Schedule J and uh, we can bring this to the council meeting for three readings. Everybody's fine with that? Mm -hmm. Okay, make the changes and then bring her back. If you can make that recommendation, uh, Director Saskew to CAO Leggett, it will be good. <coughs> Next up, uh, we will have uh, some round table. And uh, we'll start with Council Rudick. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'll start most recently and work backwards. Uh, thank you for uh, allowing me or permitting me to bring greetings to the Pisinka Festival over the weekend. I was happy to be able to represent Your Worship and the rest of Council. Um, very many excited attendees at the festival and um, comment that I heard over and over again there are many people that have come many years they were truly surprised how much change the town has gone through so there's been a lot of concerted effort from our town staff as well as homeowners and businesses so we've got new businesses we've got things that are building being built um, so there was really a feeling of excitement and I think people were generally feeling excited to be in town and very excited about what they were seeing around town so that was one comment I'd pass along um, and the other thing too was um, the importance of some of the things that were happening during the weekend too it was very gratifying to be at um, the brunch on Saturday welcoming displaced Ukrainians and to be able to have people that have arrived from a war zone a week prior and be able to make connections with people that are recently arrived in Alberta experiencing the same experiences um, and feeling a connection to Vegreville. Some of them are coming were coming from quite rural areas outside of Edmonton and coming to Vegreville um, really unaware of our existence and, and left feeling quite comfortable that they would want to come back here again. In fact, we're very envious of the support that a lot of our Ukrainian displaced persons in Vegreville are experiencing. So that would be direct um, thank you and appreciation to the committee. So Vegreville, sta Vegreville and area stands with Ukraine. We've been doing a great job because the people that are in town are feeling supported and um, that isn't necessarily the case. Some of the other people are feeling like they have food and shelter but they have no connection to community and that really is an important part of what we're offering here. Um, the other thing I've heard a little bit about grass cutting and uh, I know that it's been raining a lot so I will look forward to seeing that uh, catch up as it always does this time of year um, but that's pretty much what I'd like to share thank you very much Councillor Rorva well I can say for the first time I got no phone calls <laughs> since the last one which I don't remember the last time I got to say that maybe uh, some residents assumed I'd be at the lake but um, the one thing I did hear, and unfortunately I wasn't around this weekend, but everybody just said what a great job it was and how nice it was to see everybody uh, out over the weekend. So that's actually all I have this time. Okay. Councilor Curtis. 
Thank you. Yeah, I'll echo what uh, Councilor Ravis said. Just everybody happy about the uh, Ukrainian festival. Um, and that's pretty much all I have for today. Great. I can echo everybody else about passing good, uh, passing good days. It was uh, well received by the community. Lots of people in town having a good time. It was a little noisy at night. I kind of heard a few, you know, revving engines and stuff like that. So there's some excitement in town, that's for sure. Um, that's about all that happened in the past week for me. It was the best good festival and <coughs> just good things being said this week. So, Excellent. Councillor uh, Gilfish and Lemko. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Your Worship. Um, again, thanks to the uh, fellow councillors who took in the Pasanka Festival, the Ukrainian Days, and uh, were there uh, at the shows and all that. I unfortunately was away. Uh, I was really busy. Um, I, I have one question. Uh, it's on the 50th Street across from uh, East Line there in that pie-shaped lot. There seems to be a large number white uh, oil field equipment bags. I don't know, are they encroaching onto town property or is that, I just, it just seems like the, I drove by there and uh, there's a lot there. And are they operating within the zone requirements for the area? I'm just curious, cause it's, it's, it's an eyesore. Well, Dale's gonna tell you about the type of businesses they do there and their thread protectors. So. Yeah, correct. It's a thread protector company um, in that district. They're allowed outside storage as a discretionary use. We've been checking into it because obviously you drive by. I don't like the fact that they're stacked up as high as they are. Um, it's dangerous. And I have spoken with Phil just just yesterday um, as we've just returned, unfortunately. But yeah, it's on our it's on our target for sure to go visit and have a have a chat. Yeah. Yeah. Typically, they have them shipped <coughs> out, and uh, but maybe there's no market for them right now. I don't know, but. We'll have that conversation with you. Uh, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Barry. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, two or three items. First of all, I'd like to give a shout out to the U13 and U17 girls for winning gold uh, at the Lakeland Cup. So they'll be representing Vegreville and the Lakeland District at the Provincials this weekend in Camrose. So good luck and uh, congratulations on your victories. The next one that I had was. Uh, I went by the park a couple of times this weekend and I was amazed how many vehicles were in there. The park was extremely busy along with Pasanka days uh, and it, it just goes to show how many people are stopping to see our Ukrainian Easter egg. <laughs> the, uh, so I, I, was, I was really pleased with uh, the numbers of people that were in town and I'd driven the uh, farm all a tractor down with a display down to the Pasanka days and especially when I was coming back uh, the number of people around town and I always find it amusing when the car passes me from out of province and is taking pictures um, so I try and smile and the last one was something that was brought up to me by a couple of residents about grass cutting to some extent but it's the aspect of who's responsible now for grass at the football field along um, golf course road there and not only has it not been cut much but there's some very large patches of dead grass in there is that uh, field going to be used this year is one of the questions because it's in fairly bad shape it was cut yesterday but uh, cutting the grass doesn't uh, bring the dead grass back yeah so so it's a uh, I can tell you right now, up to now, the uh, the football association of football, whatever we, they are, have been in charge of it for the last couple of years, and they've been mowing it the way they see fit. But they've been keeping it in great shape, so I'm just trying to figure out what happened in some of these areas. It's unfortunate. And I'm not blaming anybody. I'm just asking the question as to if they are going to be having a season, uh, is there any way that can be helped out to try and get that grass to recover? So yeah, we were we haven't heard anything from them, so we just we gave Parks direction to get it cut for now, and like I say, we're still waiting to find out if there is going to be a season, and it is their responsibility to maintain that field. So, but we just decided to cut it because yeah, it was looking bad. So, 
Okay, well, I'll take it at that. Thank as far you. as the dead grass goes, I don't understand that neither because that wasn't there the last few years. There is a, a lot, it's a major, like yeah. somebody put something down or something. Yeah. Like, it concerns me. It's like somebody rounded it up or something. I don't know. I'll check into that. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you all. Um, I want to thank uh, those members of council that were took in the Fasanka Festival and uh, uh, Councilor Riddick for stepping up for me and stuff and everybody. I've been out of action for a little bit here, but I feel like I'm um, getting back in the game. I've had a, a few complaints and I brought them to the right, the right departments in town and uh, I'm pretty sure they've been handled. So, so like I said, I'm looking forward to be out, out and about again, and uh, just I just need to take it easy. So, next up we have director's reports, and we're going to start with Director Saskia. Thank you, Worship. So I have touched base on my director highlight already, as you ask questions regarding the taxes. So as we know, the June 30th taxes were due. And we have 3.36 million outstanding as of right now, which is about 27.9% of our total levy. I have gone ahead and looked at what Her Majesty the Queen owes us, and that's $2.37 million. So if we took that out of the running, we actually only have $993,000 of taxes outstanding, which makes up 8.67%. So actually, we've done a very good job of collecting taxes this year, and people have been very good at paying. And remember that this is also, these balances outstanding are people that are registered for our tax incentive payment plan. So there, there's still taxes outstanding that will be collected. So a question I have is about land titles, and have we seen a lot of problems there, or are we getting through it, or how, are we, are they, is it being frustrating for the new homeowners or where are we at actually people have been very good we made every effort that we could to contact new homeowners like I our tax clerk has sent letters out knowing properties the some of the lawyers in town were doing very good jobs of letting us know who the new owners were who the new contacts were and we reached out saying hey if the previous owner was on um, paperless like you didn't even get an assessment to your mailbox so you need to contact us and make sure that your assessments are taken care of so the collection rate that we have and what's still outstanding it's pretty evident to me that people were on top of it we did do those social media posts as well so I'm sure there are a few people that probably did fall through the cracks but it seems like despite the issues that we're having with land titles people have been well educated on it and made an effort to pay their taxes on time any other questions? Go ahead, uh, Councillor Rudy. So I know the answer, but I'll ask it. So it's on uh, our meeting. Are we able to levy late charges to Her Majesty the Queen? We are not. No. So I'm just curious, uh, would it be a case if, for example, a surplus was declared, would that be due in part to money that was perhaps owed to municipalities across the province? I don't know that for tax purposes or for like actual accounting purposes, a surplus would actually have to have these payables because they can't say that they don't owe us this money. So that would have to be recorded by their sort of say auditors or the financial people at the government. So that um, that amount payable will be accrued in any surplus that they're saying. So th that amount is already recorded. Okay, well that's good to know, but it would be probably um, a good practice for us to make sure that we share that with our MLA and if we have any opportunity to share with our provincial association too that this is potentially not an issue for us because we have enough money in reserve but this is a substantial portion of our taxes and we would never be allowed to be late on any of our remittances so again it's probably good business practice to continue to be good partners with our provincial friends and maybe we can share that when we have an opportunity with our MLA. And we could spin this the other way. If we had that $2.3 million, if we don't need that money right away, I could be investing it for a higher interest rate. True that. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, Director Rowe. Thank you, Your Worship. A uh, couple items. Uh, so with marketing and uh, communications, uh, you've seen the new banners have been installed uh, downtown so they look uh, look really nice and 
So the black banners uh, that have the logo on it will be staying permanently, and the yellow ones that have the historic uh, downtown, mm -hmm. those are going to be what we can what uh, we consider the rotating banners. So uh, as more banners are are produced, that's those are the ones that'll get changed. So uh, I've been collaborating with uh, four community areas uh, within the community that are surrounding some park and open spaces and asking for public input into the open space and park development. And we're receiving uh, a lot of uh, good feedback. Uh, we've got some community champions that are uh, sort of compiling the ideas for us and so that we can bring those to council down the road and we can develop park plans and start planning for what we want in all of these open spaces. Uh, myself along with CAO, CAO Leggett and Corporate Services Director Saskew, we've uh, been we've met with the Rotary Club uh, on their bike and skate park. They've uh, received their full grant funding and they're now moving forward with uh, New Line Skate. Uh, we're going to be working. The uh, the park unfortunately won't be able to be uh, started until the spring of 2023. Uh, just simply because New Line can only do so many parks in one skate parks in one year and uh, they won't be able to get to it this year. So we're going to be trying to do some groundwork, some, some of the park development, benches, things like that. And then uh, first thing in the spring, the, the actual park work itself will start. Uh, a pool update, they are working on it today and the pipe has been replaced, the new valves are in place, no leaks happened when they turned it on. Uh, so they're basically stabilizing the tank right now and I will have some more information. It, it may be in the next few hours that we find out if everything's going to circulate fine and no other troubles. Um, the fire services uh, wanted me to let uh, town council know that on July 20th, uh, the Texas 4000 group will be uh, coming through Vegreville and they'll be at the Vegreville station spending the night uh, and evening here. So if uh, any councillors are interested in coming meeting our young riders for that are biking all the way from Texas to Anchorage, Alaska, uh, they would certainly uh, enjoy having some council representation there. And there's also going, they're planning for a muscular dystrophy boot drive on August uh, 6th, uh, and that'll be at the, the Vegreville Power Center uh, doing their annual drive for uh, muscular dystrophy. And I guess one, one last thing, I would like to congratulate my IPND colleague who just passed 31 years with the town of Vegreville on June 3rd. You didn't even know, did you? <laughs> Thank you, Director Rowe. Your timing is perfect. <laughs> That's all I have. Thank you, Director Rowe. I guess officially, according to our uh, rules of order, that the Deputy Mayor, I should pass over the chairing to you. So I'll pass this over to you. If there are any questions, for example, the two with the starred items, Councillor Lemko, are what is next on the agenda. Is that the rest of your report, Director Rowe? That is my report. I thank you for that. We'll move on to count. Sorry. I just have a question, Director Rowe. Um, okay. Just uh, the update you gave on the pool, uh, does that, is there any update, is that um, including the water slide that would be up and going, or are we still waiting on those parts? And do we have just an updated timeline on that? I know it was a case of not being able to get them in, not that it wasn't ordered so so the the slide the slide float can't be installed until this is fixed so once we know this is fixed then the slide float can get installed which so? yes, as far as I know it's uh, like I say they just they just have to work in conjunction with each other so once we know this is all working the pool is stabilized and the water is uh, goes through its filter process then the then the flow can be installed perfect yeah I know that just unfortunately they were kind of on a back order for that part so if it's good then it's in place and we can move it along soon hopefully okay go ahead uh, councillor rudick um 
because the pool has been down quite a bit lately, is there something in place for people that have passes, for example? Do we have a mechanism to be able to extend them if we've missed? I don't, I don't know what the accu accumulation of downtime is. Probably close to a month. Do they get an e another three weeks at the end of their pass? or? The slide has been down for a month, but the pool's only been down for uh, a week and a half now. So. Okay, thank you. So there's nothing in place for a credit. Great. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much. Director Lefebvre. Thank you, Worship. Just a few items. Um, just if you see a directional boring crew out in the near future, there there's a new tower that was placed in the Kubota yard, and that's for uh, NCS Net, that's for rural internet service. So they're bringing a fiber optic line in pretty much down 47th to Golf Course Road, and they're going right around the outside of town past Prosperity, up Highway 16A, and then into the Kubota yard. And they're gonna connect there to improve their broadband service to the rural mm -hmm. customers. So if you see that, that's what's happening. Uh, quickly on our park, the offsite, um, which is the, the, the enforced main from the new lift station to the lagoons. The chamber vault has, has been installed. They've got the splitter vault connected to um, primary cell one, and they're connecting to primary cell four as their second, as an option. Uh, so that's rolling along um, the lift station itself the exterior brickwork is about 70 percent complete and that's coming along nice so we've chosen a nice gray with a slightly darker gray for the corners so it's a gray uh, neutral type building that doesn't stand out and say look at me that's how they design them now uh, the on-site uh, as you can imagine it's mostly a lot of dewatering going on right now and pumping and we did start uh, finally an, an agreement for a traffic impact assessment for the park with uh, Maple Engineers. And that started, that'll start tomorrow. They'll start the work on that and negotiated a, a better agreement than they were offering before. So we're gonna so we'll start on that right away. And of course, the installation of a new signed crosswalk at 45 A Street and 56 AF. And we'll get on that. So worship, that is my report, unless there's any questions. Off the hook, I guess you're good. Thank you. Okay, up next is the CAO uh, action item report. Everybody has seen it. And is there any questions on that? Since he's not here, it'd be hard to get any answers. It is. Yeah. So everybody sees the upcoming events that's happening. I have one that I'd like to bring up is the, the <coughs> antique car collection. Or oh, I better get it right because I don't want to get. It. Collector Car Appreciation Day, which is going to be July the 8th. I'll be making this presentation to the Iron Runners Club at 4 o'clock at the Egg Park. If anybody would like to join me, please show up. Is there any other business of council? Seeing none, I'll take a motion to go into closed session. Councillor Bullock makes the motion. All those in favour? Carried. <coughs> 